My question is a little bit about advertising and it changes the course of the conversation slightly and it's a serious question, Professor. If the world had not discovered your great thinking and your writing, how would you go about creating a demand for it? What would be your advertising campaign? What would be the, the gist of it? And what section of the media I, would you I use? Do. I, I put people on. I put them on. Uh, putting people on means teasing them, challenging them, upsetting them, befuddling them. Any comic, any comic puts on his audience by uh, hurting them. You can't name a comic who doesn't put on his public by hurting them. The technique of putting people on, in my case, consists simply in pointing to the things they have ignored, the things that concern them very nearly, but uh, have been totally pushed aside as insignificant. Um, a put on, a put on is, a, is a, a sort of situation that I study a good deal. Can advertisers it, use it to effect? Uh, advertising is, to a large degree, put on, yes, and has, there has to be a certain comic element in the good advertising. Comic is always the registration of a grievance. You, uh, uh, the funny man is the man with the grievance, whether it's W.C. Fields or Rabelais. What's, what's the grievance of an advertiser? What kind of grievance would it be? Obviously, it could vary, but... He, uh, <laughs> The grievance, of course, is you're not buying my product. <laughs> and, uh, yes, I suppose, yeah. Very simple. See it in a new light. Yes, in the glasses this time. Does the fact that Professor Bernowski's book, The Ascent of Man, the fact that it was on the bestseller list in America for month after month, is that a victory for advertising and marketing, or is that a victory for Professor Bernowski's ideals and the message he was trying to get across? I didn't see the, his shows, and, uh, of course, The Ascent of Man is a is a popular cliché, also very nostalgic, since that is not necessarily the way things are going. <laughs> but, no, I, I, I know that the, the bestseller is a mysterious thing that is uh, mainly created. It's not a spontaneous thing. Publishers have methods for creating bestsellers at any time they have to. And uh, it means investing a good deal of money in a book. Now, his program had many millions of dollars invested in it, quite apart from the book. So a big million dollar program, a multi-million dollar program, automatically guarantees a bestseller status for the book off the shelf. In the second bracket, yeah. Professor, um, getting back to your rear view mirror syndrome and your new definition of it tonight, shouldn't we, um, some of us, especially politicians, be looking in that same rear-view mirror to see what carnage is being left behind? Well, in the case of politics, it's not too difficult to see what's being left behind. <laughs> the, which parties are up and which are down. But um, one of the peculiar things about the effects of media on politics is that uh, parties and policies become very unimportant and the image of the politician takes on a tremendous new importance. This is television, at least. And radio politics are a completely different form. Radio politics are a completely uh, different message. Um, but TV politics does, uh, do not permit very much interest in the policy or the party. But the individual compo or a candidate must have charisma now, charisma means looking like a lot of other people. <laughs> that is a, my technical analysis of that problem. Now, poor Miss Richard Nixon looked only like Richard Nixon. He, <laughs> he was sunk. He had no charisma at all. And um, the, uh, to look like a lot of other people means acceptable people, interesting people. Uh, Carter, Jimmy Carter, looks like the all-American Southern boy, Huck Finn, in the White House. He's a, he's a big archetype. Whereas Jack Kennedy looked like the all-American boy of the um, more the Bostonian variety of the successful, um, pushy, and aggressive boy. Um, Carter, the Southern boy, is not aggressive, whimsical, Huck Finn style. 
Uh, first time that uh, a Deep South boy ever entered the American White House. So the Civil War is over. <laughs> <laughs> did you see uh, Richard Nixon's programs with David Frost? Yes, I did. I, uh, was, I was amazed. I was, I was going to ask you, how do you think Richard Nixon, Nixon well, came out? I thought, this is the first time in human history that a major actor in history played himself. <laughs> I'm glad I asked you. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes? What is your interpretation of my professor comments about the power of the nature of the electric media uh, to say that it would be a waste of time for the regulatory authorities to concern themselves with the content of television and radio? If it's a wrong interpretation, what particular things do you think they ought to be thinking about controlling? I, I would hate to regulate the thoughts of any bureaucracy, but the tendency of any, of any medium is to attract to itself types of content which are consistent with its limits. And uh, so, in the long run, they, it's uh, just as a people get the government they deserve, so the medium gets the content it deserves. And uh, there has to be some sort of interplay some sort of harmony between these things. And I would, uh, I would point to the fact that TV is primarily concerned with complex processes. And the kinds of content that best serve it are complicated processes. Uh, radio is far more a package medium, far more concerned with the definite and wrapped up message and package. It's a hot medium. And whereas TV with its cool or involving character uh, is much less able to cope with packages and much more concerned with processes. And so you, if you watch the uh, even Sesame Street, you will see the, this grotesque character peeping out at you. It's, uh, the processes at Sesame Street is made by advertising men. And uh, they understand, they have learned the nature of this medium very thoroughly. And it is a very much a teddy bear, tactile, playful medium. And a very dramatic one. Yes. I was disappointed that uh, Professor McLuhan's address didn't confront more serious uh, technological issues, uh, nuclear energy in particular. And I'd like to ask him um, if he'd agree that nuclear energy represents mass suicide, the ultimate expression of the death wish, or more in line with his terminology, the last ditch fight to the death of the left hemisphere world of the military industrial complex. And he one? claims that the world is moving towards I'm the sorry, look, we, we really can't hear very clearly. I'm and, sorry. and secondly, do you think you could relate it a little bit more to the mainstream, oh, what we've been talking right. about? Well, Don't well, exclude um, it, but just... No, Professor, I, I can handle that. Professor McLuhan claims that the world... No, 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 we've heard that, we've heard that. No, much. this is, this get, is get the second the point, part of please. it. He claims the world is moving towards the software world of no. the brain's right hemisphere, but uh, the other side now seems to have such an upper hand in terms of big money and media control that I'm curious to know how he thinks they're going to lose. Thank you. It's uh, there are a whole bundle of questions there, but uh, the... Uh, Main development in the, uh, these electric media is the loss of private identity. Mass man means man as related to all other men simultaneously. So the nuclear world is a kind of ripoff as far as private uh, identity and private values and goals are concerned. And uh, just how uh, that relates to the atom bomb and so on, I'm it would take a little while to develop, but these forms have a kind of inner logic, an inner dynamic which can be traced and uh, which can be discerned and patterned and recognized. Yes, uh, right at the back. Father's person, that's right, yes, you're right. Professor McLuhan, I'd like to ask you, do you think that media will always be commercially based and if it will be always be commercially based, um, do you see it getting any more responsible or, or otherwise? I, I appreciate the issues you, you raise, 
But um, the commercial sponsor of the media is naturally more sensitive to the audience than anybody. The commercial sponsor is going to demand a kind of rapport between his investment and the show, which will uh, ensure a great deal of popularity and uh, representativeness to the show. If you can think of a sponsor or a, who ignores the audience, um, maybe the CBC in Canada. So that means a, a six big bureaucratic um, organization which uh, feels it's quite above the needs of the audience. And uh, so it creates a great many unpopular shows. <clears throat> I wouldn't say they're especially interesting. They're just unpopular. <laughs> and to what extent the BBC is in the same boat, I don't know. But you, may, you might be able to comment. Yeah. You know, I'm, going to, I'm going to have to sneak off and have a pee. Uh, uh, Professor, you were talking uh, earlier about how the new brain research uh, has opened up new avenues in perception uh, about the left hemisphere being more towards the logical aspects and the right towards the intuitive. Um, can you enlarge on the parallel you use between uh, how this is related to the Eastern and Western cultures? Yes. The, uh, the uh, people of the West developed their visual point of view and their acuity of vision along with Euclidean geometry. No other country in the world ever had Euclidean geometry except the country of the phonetic alphabet. Without phonetic alphabet, you don't have Euclidean space. Uh, in the, there's no U Euclid in the Orient. Um, the, there's neither is there any individual identity, private identity in the Orient. But the, the kinds of uh, left and right hemisphere things correspond pretty well to east and west since the lineal nature of the left hemisphere is very visual. Visual space is the only space that is lineal and connected. Acoustic space is not lineal or connected. Acoustic space is a sphere who we hear from all directions at once. Acoustic space is a sphere whose center is everywhere and whose margin is nowhere. That is a simultaneous sound which creates that kind of space. It is the space of the sound bubble in rock music. But right hemisphere is simultaneous acoustic and this is very favorable to the corporate identity of oriental man people who play it by ear, uh, as opposed to those people who have a strong bias of point of view and who play it by the eye and uh, by logical connected estimates, bottom line, quantity, and so on. This is all left hemisphere. But the right hemisphere has no bottom line and is interested only in quality, not in quantity. And so the Otherworldliness, the non-worldly orient, with its interest in the way of life rather than in the amount of product. You might say Polynesia. Uh, various attempts have been made to organize the Polynesians into dynamic <clears throat> producers of this or that, and uh, they remain completely indifferent to such performance. They're very acoustically oriented people, very right hemisphere. But um, the right and left hemispheres affect both of us to some degree. They're, it's not just a plain either or. We are both, we use both hemispheres to some degree. But in some cultures, the one or the other gets much stress, much play. Professor McLuhan, I'm afraid we've come to the uh, end of our message, if not the end of our medium. Thank you very much for talking with us tonight. Thank you, everyone else, too, for, for joining us. I'd like to thank uh, the organisers of Radio 78 and 2SM for having us uh, with them. It's uh, there and our gesture to the ecumenical movement, at least broadcasting-wise. There'll be another Monday conference next week. Till then, good night. Thank you. Tonight's Monday conference has come from the ballroom of the Hilton Hotel, Sydney. Our special guest was Canadian media analyst, Professor Marshall McLuhan.